Hey guys, so last time we talked about one of the continuous random variables and now we're going to go ahead and focus on not quite another particular type of continuous variable but one concept that most books kind of cover a little earlier but I like to touch upon it a little later once we have a better understanding of standard deviations and things like that and that's going to be the Chebyshev's rule. So Chebyshev's rule, for any distribution regardless of the shape, Chebyshev's rule helps you make estimations for probabilities using the standard deviation as a ruler. <clears throat> and so again, a lot of books cover these a little earlier, but I like to go ahead and get a better grasp of probabilities, um, what it is for a mean and a standard deviation. So we kind of saw a couple of those things with a discrete random variable. And now this here is for any variable or any distribution, regardless of its shape. So now between the mean, which again is little mu, right? So this little guy here is a mean or average. And then sigma, which is that fancy looking O thing, um, it's just a Greek way of saying standard deviation. And so between the mean and minus one standard deviation and the mean plus one standard deviation, we have what they basically say very few. And so you can't really say too much about that because since it's such a small gap, you can't really say a certain percentage or a, an interval or anything like that because there's not much information and there's probably not going to be very much happening in between that interval. But now between two standard deviations away from the mean, so the mean and above two and the mean and below two, you have at least, and at least is a very key word. It's not that there's exactly that many observations because again, this rule is very contingent on the ideal that we don't know the shape of the distribution. So we can't say for certain a probability, but we can say that at least this many um, observations should fall within this interval. And so how many? At least three-fourths or 75%, however you want to say that. And then between the mean above three standard deviations and the mean below three standard deviations, again, regardless of the shape, we say that there's at least eight ninths of observations. So where do they come up with these numbers, three fourths and eight ninths, did they just make them up? No, not really. In general, the pro proportion of observations within any interval between the mean and above any k standard deviations, so two, three, seven, 19, whatever that k represents, that's just the number of standard deviations above and below the mean that we're focusing on. So again, the mean plus a k number of standard deviations and the mean minus a k number of standard deviations, that's the probability of us finding an observation within that um, gap is at least one minus one over k squared. And so if you want to break down other variables, again, remember x is any individual observation. Uh, the mean is the mean of that uh, random variable x. Standard deviation is just the sigma of that standard uh, random variable x. And then also k is just a constant. Again, k just represents how many standard deviations above and below we're interested in, right? And so it has, it's irregardless of, you know, it doesn't stand for anything. It's just literally a number. How many standard deviations above and how many standard deviations below the mean are we interested in? So enough about that crazy formula. So for the following data set, what's the interval for which at least three-fourths of the observations lie? So we want at least three-fourths. Sounded funny, three fourths. So three fourths of observations, well, let's go, it kind of looks like a familiar number, right? It should be, because three fourths of observations, we expect that at least three fourths should lie between two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below the mean. So this here is basically telling us the mean plus or minus two standard deviations, right? So again, plus or minus is essentially saying plus and then minus, so above and below. Now. Do we know the mean? No, right, we just have this data set. Great, do we know the standard deviation? No, we just have a data set. So we're gonna have to actually find these, and so this is just a recap how to get the mean and standard deviation. Um, so we got one, three, five, seven, nine, and 11, right? And so those are each individual observations. And now, what did we do next to get the mean? So all we did was just add everything up, right? So once we add everything up, we end up getting 36. Now our next step was to square everything, right? So one squared is one, three squared is nine, five squared is 25, seven squared is 49, nine squared is 81, and once 11 squared is 121. Oops. So once we squared all that, and again, this should just be a recap of everything we've seen before. So once we square that, we add everything up, 
And I don't expect you to do this math that quickly. I do this ahead of time so that we can save some time um, during our concept. During the time that we're talking about our concept. So we have our squared all the numbers, added them up. All the numbers themselves added them up. Now to get the mean, that's adding up all the x's, right? Dividing by however many x's there are, right? And the standard deviation, a little scarier. So we have square root of the sum of each individual observation squared minus the sum of each individual observation, square that number, divided by n all over n minus 1. So we have this big square root above everything else. So let's just start plugging in numbers. So let's go ahead and look at the numbers that we have here. So 36 goes where? in these two formulas. 36 represents this guy here and that little guy in within the parentheses, right? And now let's do the other one. So we have 286. That represents, we square every number and then add it, right? And then our n is what? Our n is our sample size, so how big is our sample in this case? We have six observations. So once we plug in our numbers, we get 36 over 6. And that's just 6. right? And then this one's a little scarier, but it's fine. We just plug them everything in, and we're good to go. So 286 minus 36 squared over 6 divided by 6 minus 1. right? So once we do all that math, we end up getting 3.7417. All right, so you have the mean and the standard deviation. Now, what's our next step? They're saying, what's the interval for which at least three-fourths of observations lie? So we have the mean. I have no, no idea what the distribution looks like, right? But we can go ahead and find a proportion of how many observations should at least fall within this interval. So our interval that we said, three-fourths corresponds to the mean above two standard deviations and the mean below two standard deviations. So let's say our lower limit is... the mean minus two standard deviations. And so that ends up giving us six minus two times 3.7417. And so our lower one, we end up getting negative 1.4834. So that's our lower end of the stick. Now let's get the higher end, right? So lower and upper limits. So this upper limit is the mean plus two standard deviations, right? So we get 6 plus 2 times 3.7417. And that gives us 13.4834. Right? So our final answer ends up being 13.4834. At least three fourths of observations between, and the way we represent this in any interval for statistics is we put the lower one first, so we put parentheses the lower limit, I'm going to say 1.48 just to save some space, and the upper limit is 13.48. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our final answer. So we should expect that at least three fourths of observations lie above two standard above the mean by two standard deviations and below the mean by two standard deviations, aka negative one point forty eight and thirteen point forty eight. And that's about it. So example one complete. So let's go ahead and move on to number two. So for number two, we have given that a data set has a mean and standard deviation of ten and two point five, so woo, you don't have to calculate that. <laughs> Good for us. Respectively, how many observations are expected to lie within 3.75 and 16.25? So how do we do this? So now they're not telling us the interval, right? They're actually telling us, they're not telling us to find the interval. They're telling us the interval and saying at least how many observations or at least what proportion of observations would you expect to find within this interval? So we have to actually find a probability. But with the probability of finding any variable, using Chebyshev's rule, it's 
1 minus 1 over k squared, right? But what is k? k, remember, is the number of standard deviations above and below the mean we are when we're talking about our interval. But how can we find that? So if I know that the mean is 10, let me just draw a number line. And again, I'm not going to draw the distribution because I don't know really what it looks like. So I'm just going to stick to this. We have a mean of 10, and we want from 3.75 to 16.25. Cool? So the way we do this is we need to basically find how many standard deviations away is 16.25. So if this whole thing is between 10 and 16.25, we have a gap of 6.25. And then 3.75 and 10, we have another gap of 6.75. So we're above and below an equal amount, but now we need to break this amount, that's 6.75, into standard deviations. So how many standard deviations is this away? So the way we do this is we get k, is the number of standard deviations, right, is how far the number actually is divided by the standard deviation itself. Does that make sense? Because all we're really trying to find is how many standard deviations away is 16.25. So here's a 2.5, here's another 2.5, and there's going to be a little more. So 6.25 divided by 2.5, we end up getting 2.5. So each of these is, even though it's 6.25, they're actually also 2.5 standard deviations away. Does that make sense? So we basically rewrote that gap of 6.25 in terms of how many standard deviations away does that represent. And it's 2.5 or 2.5 standard deviations away from the mean. Cool, so now that we have our k, we can plug that into our formula now. So the probability of finding an observation within that um, gap is at least 1 minus 1 over 2.5 squared. Right? And so it's at least 1 minus 1 over and then 6.25. And that gives us 0.84. And the reason why I'm going to highlight this as well is just because it gets very difficult to kind of see where our answers are because there's a bunch of numbers throwing at us. So what we basically have to do is here's our interval, but how far away is each of those from our mean, right? We found that they were 6.25 away. But now, 6.25 isn't very cute. It doesn't really tell us much because our formula is based off of how far, in terms of standard deviations, is that gap, right? So 6.25, that breaks down into two and a half full standard deviations away, right? So now we plug in that 2.5 as our k into our formula, and so we get 1 minus 1 over 2.5 squared, and that gave us 0.84. So we should expect that at least 0.84, or at least 84% of my observations should lie between 3.75 and 16.25. And that's about it for the Chevy Sheds rule. So let's go ahead and move on to some practice problems.